What's going on, I Do Podcast listeners? Hey guys, hope you're having an awesome Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today. We are coming to you from our living room studio where we have two mics set up for the first time. Can you believe that? I know. It's pretty crazy to think that we've been sharing one mic for almost three years. We've been huddled <laughs> over one mic. I wouldn't even call it, you know, we, we've done a good job sharing for sure, but we'll have to send a picture of, of uh, we'll put it on our Instagram of our setup <laughs> now, and then we'll do a retro one uh, of how it's been, where we had this mic on this like little three inch tripod and we would just, because we, we've been moving around we were just usually in a living room or a random uh, place in the house and uh, huddled over this mic. And we're trying to look at each other as we talk and you can't, I mean, it's impossible. basically try to put a water <laughs> bottle on the table and, and then talk to the water bottle while also looking at your partner sitting next to you and you'll get an idea. Yeah. <laughs> or it's if you not have a easy. mic, <laughs> but, but it's not, it's not easy, but it, and it's just when we, started recording the intros with two mics, we were looking at each other and we're like, man, we got to set this up. And Sarah is the audio engineer. And it's surprisingly not as easy to do as you would think as far as setting up two mics and then recording through Skype. So long story long, we got two <laughs> mics. This was the first episode. And it, honestly, it kind of took me a second. It was like, this is kind of weird. Yeah. Like Sarah's across the table and I'm looking at her and my mic stand is like falling down. Whatever. We're going to, we're <laughs> going to fix We've had some that. issues on this interview, but <laughs> But no. anyways, definitely a good thing to do uh, in with your partner is uh, be able to look at them when you're talking. <laughs> that, that's a good, that's a good start for good communication. So maybe the shows are going to, you're going to see a drastic improvement now that, uh, now that we're looking at each other with our two separate mics. So <laughs> it was an exciting day for episode 117. Yes. We'll, ha we'll have to call this uh, the two mic episode. There'll be before two mics and then after two mics. Yeah. And this is the, the demarcation. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, on today's show, we had Dr. Jason Whiting and we talked about rationalizing and making excuses in your relationship. But really, we just covered a broad range of topics. And uh, I know we all do it. I know I do it in the relationship where you are saying something and it's not Right. You know, and you maybe you're you're saying something mean to your to your partner or that's just a little bit off because you're you're upset. And then you can go back and rationalize that. We're like, well, yeah, I said that because you were being a jerk, or I said that because you were supposed to do this. It's easy to rationalize. We can all make up whatever excuse we want for our actions, but it's not productive in the relationship. So w with Jason today, we go through the steps to to avoid that or to, to deal with that and change those habits. And then we really just talk about so much more. Yeah, we do. I mean, we go from talking about making excuses to making sure you're not drinking 16 bottles of Mountain Dew a day. Yes. <laughs> Don't, Which, yeah, it's, it sounds that. crazy, but Jason had a client who, uh, who actually was doing that. And once he cut that out of his, his lifestyle and started eating healthy and sleeping and, and drinking more water, him and his wife, their relationship problems got a little bit easier. I don't say it didn't fix it, but they, they started to do better. So, uh, we talk about how that can benefit your relationship too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. It seems so basic and I'm glad Jason brought it up, but if you're not having a foundation of, let's just say even sleep and you wake up and we've talked about this on the podcast before, if you and your partner had a bad night of sleep or baby was up all night, chances are they're going to be more irritable and that's a lifestyle thing that we can change, you know, get better sleep. Don't drink 16 cans of Mountain Dew. And you're probably going to react in a much better way 
And when your partner maybe says something that you don't like rather than snapping back at them or trying to rationalize a mean reaction, you're going to come from a better place. So, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the tips that Jason gave was to kind of accept the process. And, and sometimes you just got to pick your battles and, and let some things go. And, you know, looking back in the first year of having Stella, Chase and I didn't get a lot of sleep. And there were plenty of times where we probably snapped at each other when we shouldn't have. And so I wish that we would have, you know, both of us kind of just let some things go because at the end of the day, we are both good people and not normally mean to each other. So I think that's an important thing to remember that uh, just sometimes give your partner the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Jason talked about doing that in, and Sarah's being hard on herself, but I would say she was a uh, champ because first year she's doing most of the late nights uh, nursing. <laughs> I was, I was getting the rest and she would, yeah. And we, we establish it pretty fast. Like maybe she would be a little snappy and nothing crazy, but then I would try to be like, all right, you know, and I think she would do, she's like, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I shouldn't have done that. But yeah, it's just giving your partner the benefit of doubt. So really just so many uh, great things in today's episode. And Chase and I put together a new blog post titled the four big relationship don'ts and how to avoid them. And so we would love if you guys check that out. We're starting to blog more and kind of incorporate some of the knowledge that we've learned from doing over, what, 117 interviews now. So we would love it if you guys checked out that article. We'll link to it in the show notes and in the podcast descriptions. And we would love your feedback. Yeah, I can't take too much credit. I just proofread it. <laughs> so if there's any grammatical errors, that's on me. Sarah, <laughs> Sarah uh, has been pulling the weight lately and we've kind of switched things up with uh, the the roles, I guess, in, in that I've been watching Stella, our two-year-old, a lot more. And Sarah's been hammering out some great content for you guys. And and uh, that's probably a whole nother episode topic we can talk about is, is our, and we have, but the relationship roles and certainly if you have kids establishing those and we've uh, talked about, you know, Sarah's like, I got to work on the podcast and I need you to watch Stella. We communicated that and, and now we're, we're settling in. I'm still, still working on, on uh, dealing with a two-year-old for much longer than I've had to in the past. <laughs> You're in doing spurts. fabulous. Yeah. So anyways, I think that's a good topic. We'll, uh, we'll cover yeah, add it to the, sometime soon. To the but as always, we really appreciate you guys listening, uh, sending us emails, giving us feedback and uh, topic requests and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, hope you have a great day and enjoy today's show. Today's show is sponsored by Talkspace. Talkspace is the online therapy company that lets you get therapy through your smartphone via text, video, and audio. It's therapy for how we live today. To sign up, visit Talkspace.com forward slash I do to get $30 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com forward slash I do. Today's show is also sponsored by findyourtrainer.com. It's America's largest personal trainer resource that matches you with your perfect personal trainer. Train anywhere, anytime. Visit findyourtrainer.com forward slash I do and use the promo code I do to get $50 off your first four sessions. Hi, Jason. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Hi, guys. Glad to be here. So we've given our listeners a little overview, a little bit of information on your background in helping people with their relationships. So why don't you take a minute, tell us about yourself and why you enjoy helping people improve the relationships in their life. Sure. Uh, I have always been interested in relationships, even since when I was young, and particularly what makes people be drawn so strongly to each other. You know, people fall in love. You hear songs on the radio, every other song, or even more than that is about love. So we're kind of fascinated by it. So people have this really powerful 
instinct to, you know, get into a relationship. But what then happens to make so many relationships tricky or challenging or painful or even worse, you know, damaging? And so for me, that was just always really fascinating. So I started with a psychology undergraduate degree and then found the field of marriage and family therapy and did some graduate work uh, there and have been a professor in that field now for a long time and study, uh, you know, what makes people tick, what makes them uh, connect and then kind of fall apart at times. Well, yeah, it is interesting how love and relationships is permeates all aspects of our culture. You mentioned songs, obviously movies it, and relationships are the foundation of our lives a lot of times and they can be so fulfilling, but it, it's just interesting and why we love having people like yourself on to put the information out that as much of that, as much that they're a part of our culture and in our lives, we don't focus too much on improving them. Right. And, and definitely there, there's people out there that are doing that. Those are listeners, uh, obviously are taking steps, but it, not nearly as much as it permeates just being out there and how the fairy tale story and, and the, the love songs, obviously there's, there's heartbreak songs, but there's not songs about like, how rationalizing weakens relationships and how to improve <laughs> <laughs> like what we're going to talk about today. So, um, yeah, it's, it's important work. And, and so I've just, uh, jumped the gun there and, and given our listeners a little preview, but let's dive right in and we'll talk about rationalizing in how excuses creep into even the best relationships and how they weaken them and how we can avoid that. So why don't we start by having you tell us, what it lo what rationalizing looks like in a relationship. Sure. Well, in, in any relationship, you've got two people who are different. And so they're bringing to the table different values, different preferences, different thoughts about what is the best thing to do. And, and so that inherently sets up problems, right? I mean, that sets up potential conflict. You know, you hear the Experts talk about, you know, the reasons people get divorced are things like money or housework or sex or parenting. But those are just all areas that people are going to almost every time have some differences in. And so the issue is how they deal with that. So so what happens is those differences cause some conflict and people it's easier to feel like you're right than it is to kind of hear the other person. And and so what happens is when people kind of assume they're right or they start to get frustrated or they act badly, uh, it's easier then to kind of defend yourself and come up with an excuse for what you're doing. And that that's what rationalizing it is. It's essentially coming up with a reason for what you've done that's probably not true and in some cases blatantly false. So So it might be an excuse. It might be saying something like, well, the reason... I called you that it was because you were nagging me or the reason, you know, I was late was because I was so busy at work. You know, we come up with these excuses and sometimes there might be, you know, some elements of truth, but it's more about making yourself feel better or making yourself look good in the interaction than it is about really trying to be honest and uh, helpful in that sense. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to fall into that trap of, it seems like the big thing is is not being self aware and and really s stepping outside of yourself because otherwise we just walk around all day rationalizing everything we do and none of us are saints or you know we all have our flaws no matter how good we think we might be or you know there's going to be something and so if we just go around not is is that a big part like just not being self aware Yes, because it's harder to be self-aware than it is to see somebody else's flaws, especially in a marriage or relationship where you've got somebody close by. You know, hopefully we're giving each other the benefit of the, of the doubt and, and appreciating what the other does. But especially when emotions turn negative, it's hard to be self-aware. It's hard to honestly take a look and say, you know what, when I got really upset, I said some things that I don't really mean and I shouldn't have said them. That that takes a little more work and that's easier to do later, maybe after people are calmed down, but it's harder to do in the moment. And, you know, that's a sign of maturity and, and a, a healthy relationship needs that. 
But yes, that takes a little bit of a willingness to look at your own contribution to the problem. Uh, I, I had actually a couple I was meeting with just yesterday where we were having this very discussion, uh, you know, I'm a licensed therapist and they both are, they both started calling me separately and even texting me and they were kind of telling on each other. And I said, look, it's, it's easy for you guys to see the things your spouse is doing. You know, you both are kind of acting in ways that are not helpful for the marriage, but it's harder for each of you to take a hard look at yourself and say, what do I need to do here? And that's hard, especially if the other one is not acting, you know, is not acting very maturely or if they're being difficult, it's easy to kind of give into that and, and do the same thing yourself. And that actually plays out in a lot of different ways in relationships. But uh, it, it reminded me of a funny study that I saw a while ago where people in marriages tend to gain weight together. And one of the theories was, you know, not just context of things they had around, but it's easy for me to make an excuse about my own eating if my wife, you know, she's helping herself to, you know, nachos and cheesecake. And I'm going to it's more easy for me to say, ah, I don't mind if I do, you know, I'll do the same thing. You know, people people kind of influence each other. And so when both are um, acting, you know, if one person acts badly, it's easy for the other person to act badly. So, it, again, it takes each person saying, here's what I can do better. And it really doesn't matter what you're doing. I'm going to choose to act in a healthy way. I'm going to be responsible for my own behavior, etc. And when one person does that, it often invites the other one to do it as well. You mentioned earlier that about defend, defending yourself or defending your position. And, you know, sometimes Chase and I will get in conversations where, he thinks I'm being defensive, which I do. I, I can get defensive. And uh, but then I say, no, I'm, I'm just trying to defend myself. So where do you draw the line or differentiate the two when it comes to that type of situation? That's a great question, because one of the things that marital researchers have found is that if defensiveness is always popping up in a relationship, if one person or both are never willing to kind of take responsibility for their stuff and they're always just saying, well, I didn't do that. It was your fault. Or I had a reason to for doing that. It's a, it's a problem. It's one of the predictors of divorce when a lot of defensiveness is happening. But like you said, sometimes a person is literally just trying to defend what they've done or articulate it in a way that's fair, you know, and they're trying to say the reason why I reacted this way is because I was feeling pinned down or I was feeling upset about this. And, and that's a little bit of fine line, but, but when a person can defend themselves in a way that's sort of focusing on their own behavior, and that's different than being defensive all the time, which is I'm never willing to consider what I did or um, what my behavior caused in the relationship. It, it reminds me of another study by a guy named James Pennebaker. He looked at the transcripts of couples who were interacting in a marriage and just took all the words that they said. And he found that one word was showing up more often in unhealthy relationships than in healthy relationships. And the word was you. So in other words, you know, when people are saying that a lot, you did this, you this, you're this way that's a sign of a less healthy interaction. That's why sometimes you hear about marriage skills talk, talking about using I messages. So coming back to your comment about defending yourself, if you defend yourself using I messages and, other, and talk about I felt this way or I was frustrated or I was hurt, that's different than saying you were just being so aggressive or you were so immature or you are such, you're so much like your mom. You know what I mean? Those you, those you statements tend to be attacking, whereas an I message is, is more self-aware and more responsible. So it's, it's a little bit of a fine line, but um, it's certainly appropriate to stand up for yourself uh, in that sense. Yeah, it, it is interesting how it's such a, a fine line between that defensiveness and, and defending yourself. And then I've tried to come at it from a better approach as well, where instead of being accusatory of you're being defensive, I would say, um, and we heard this on a pod on one of our uh, guests is to say, I feel like, and, and again, that's that I statement 
um, I feel like you're being defensive when I say this or that. So it's that you and I statement can can go towards both responses from both parties. And and that was really valuable. I think uh, Sarah felt like I wasn't as accusatory and just trying to open the communication. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's different when you're accusing and saying you're being defensive. It's different when, when you're saying, I'm noticing that you seem upset and I feel, you know, I, I'm concerned about that or I don't want us to be that way. You know what I mean? Those are those are different approaches to the same interaction. Exactly. And, and it, it may seem like a small difference and it kind of is, but it has exponentially different outcomes. <laughs> you know, when, when you're accusing someone, they are likely to be more defensive just because of your tone and, and the way you're communicating. And then just changing that in, in, in relationships and anything, uh, any kind of relationship, not even romantic. Like if you're a boss and, and, uh, you're trying to convey something, it's just, it's just a more productive way to communicate. And certainly if this is a person you're spending your life with, you want to, be kind to each other and, and have productive communication and not feel like you're being attacked all the time. And it's as simple as saying you versus uh, I. That's right. Yeah. Nobody likes being accused. Nobody likes being attacked. Even if the accusation is on target and accurate, it won't usually help to say the way you handled disciplining our daughter was really out of line and you were out of control. You know, that's because the person probably already knows they didn't feel very good about it. And so now you're sort of piling on. Um, and what happens when people get accused, there's almost this instantaneous physical reaction that people have when they feel like they're being attacked. It's, it's actually the same kind of physical reaction that you have when you're getting physically attacked. So for example, Think about a time like if your spouse comes stomping into the room with an angry look on their face. What happens to your body in milliseconds before any conscious thought is happening is you get fired up, right? You become concerned. You, you kind of put the defenses on. You know, you have to do that. It's sort of a biological process that, that our kind of deep brain does. It monitors. It's protecting you. And if it sees somebody stomping around angry and, and looking hostile, it starts to fire up the blood pressure and the heart rate. And so already the ability to have a calm, constructive conversation is becoming much less likely. So anyway, that's that's also one of those marriage research findings is that people who are chronically fired up and escalating are headed towards a bad end typically because it's just almost always uh, impossible to have a good conversation when people are in that fired up mode. So do you have any tips that our listeners can use to implement in their relationship to maybe help identify that they're doing these types of rationalizing and then how to eliminate them from their relationship? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one thing, because it's so easy to rationalize, is just to become a little more self-aware, like we were talking about earlier. And that takes a little bit of time and maturity um, and calm conversations. So if people are upset, if people are finding themselves starting to say or do things that are becoming more and more negative, that's the time to take a break because those are the times they're going to be making more accusations, more excuses, more rationalizing. Um, so one is to just learn how to take breaks and that has to be done in a way that is constructive and not just driving away in a huff and stewing about it. You know what I mean? That's, that's not going to help because then people become a little more entrenched in their own excuses. So if you think about a time when you've had a disagreement or, or a bad interaction with somebody, whether it's your spouse or a friend or a boss, we stew on it, right? We, we kind of process it. And the thing that happens is we tend to continue to kind of justify our own actions or think about what the other person, what we would, what we would say back to them. So, so the harder thing is to focus, like I said, on your behavior and maybe do things that are totally different, like read magazines or take a mindfulness break or go for a walk or do yoga or hit the gym, you know, things that just help you get a little bit of separation and space 
and literally help your body calm down. It always will help the thinking process and will always help people to, um, to be a little more responsible. And one researcher said that they did a study where they had people do that. They took breaks when they were kind of in the middle of conflict and they had them like read magazines, just sort of calm breaks, not stewing breaks. And he said when they would come back, it was like they had had a head transplant. You know, they, they just acted differently. They looked at each other differently. Their sense of humor had returned. And I've seen that happen many times, you know, I'll do some mindfulness in sessions where people do some deep breathing for, you know, five or 10 minutes. It doesn't take much um, for people to just calm down. And uh, that helps. It helps them to be less accusing and less uh, making excuses. It's so true. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the mindfulness and meditation. We've certainly mentioned it on this uh, podcast many times before. And it's one of those things that's becoming more and more popular, I guess, in, in the culture. Certainly other podcasts talk about it a lot, but it, it is so valuable in becoming self-aware and not letting your emotions control you. I think that's what we're we're really talking about here. And I know that I don't think I'm a particularly angry person, but I can, I'm a different person. I know that when, when I'm upset and, and whether or not what I'm being upset about is even justified, but just that that switch goes off and I'm not raging or anything, but I, I'm just not, uh, thinking rationally a lot of times and I'm not, it not going to be engaging in a productive conversation if I'm upset in talking with Sarah or, or even someone else. So taking that break or, and I think the more enlightened you are, for lack of a better word, the easier it is to, to navigate that, that you don't necessarily have to take a, a break that maybe in the moment you're really able to to squash those emotions in a good way, not letting them get the better of you. But I think a lot of us uh, aim aim to be that way, but maybe just taking that time and, and saying, um, saying something that you come up with with your partner, that there's a, like a stop word. We've talked about that on the podcast with past guests that they recommend uh, saying something, I think, it, theirs was yellow light. And it's just like, that means, all right, you know, let's take a break and establish when you're going to come back. Cause you don't want to leave it open ended. Like you mentioned, you don't want to just stew, but, uh, that, that can be such a valuable thing to do. Absolutely. And, and your metaphor of a switch is really on target because it's true that when a person becomes angry, you know, they, they have those negative emotions, the brain flips some switches. It looks different. It starts to, you know, as I was saying earlier, it starts to prepare to defend itself or to attack or whatever. And that's a different mode than just a relationship, bonding, interacting, connecting mode. It's a, and it's very difficult. Like you say, you can do it and mature couples do it. You know, they, they kind of hold their tongues and they talk through their emotions and they, they're able to, uh, you know, process what they're feeling without becoming you know, caustic or contemptuous or mean, but it's harder. And so it's easier when, you know, when you're angry to become, uh, you know, negative and it, it rarely has a good effect on, on a relationship. Um, there was another study by a guy named Roy Baumeister where he just asked people to think of a time that they made somebody else angry. And then he asked them to think of a time somebody made them angry. And what happened was, the way they described those two different things were quite different. When people said they made someone else angry, they kind of downplayed it and made excuses. And they said, well, it wasn't really that bad. And I had a good reason for doing what I did and they should get over it. You know, it was, it was just kind of a, you know, it was a thing that happened for this reason. But when they described times people had made them angry, they said, well, they just did this to be mean and I'm really upset and it did a lot of damage and kind of the point of the study was when we become angry, we shift into this mode that we defend ourselves and we excuse our own behavior and we see other people's as really negative and without reason, if that makes sense. Like people, people automatically kind of circle the wagons and, and they make, you know, they want to make themselves sound better and they, um, and they, they experience other people as harsher than they actually are. So in marriage, 
you know, you might mind read and say, well, you just said that just to be mean. Well, I doubt that the person said it just to be mean. They probably said it because they had some perfectly good excuse in their own mind for why they said it. So it's just kind of this really easy thing that we do, you know, flip into that mode of making our behavior make sense in our own heads, even when it's negative. Yeah, I um, can definitely relate to that. And there was a uh, quote that I really like in, in for not just uh, intimate relationship, but it's something along the lines of don't ascribe to malice what can often be attributed to ignorance or you can replace that by busyness or lack of sleep. Or And I've said this before because I think it's so valuable that we automatically, I think, not everyone, but m- maybe the default is that we assume that our partner or our friend or that coworker or the person that didn't return an email, we assume uh, they're just trying to be mean or they just don't care. But the reality is, like you said, that your partner is not going in with the intention to hurt you, hopefully. And if if we can kind of switch to, to give them the benefit of the doubt, that's just going to change our response. It's going to change our switch from going to to defensive and, and on the on the defense and then on the attack. And that that's really helped me a lot. Not necessarily with Sarah, because she she is not that everything's always perfect, but she's I'm definitely the more volatile one in the relationship, I guess. <laughs> Hardly. If, if you had to say it. But particularly like in business and in other stuff. Like if I don't get an email return rather than you know, oh man, this person's just writing me off. It's like, no, they're they're probably just busy, you know, and that's really helped me a lot. Yeah, that's a great quote. And and you're right that it's it's easy for us to take things personally. I mean, our experiences are the most important to us, right? I mean, we all are naturally self-centered that way, but they they have their reality too. And so when you have that kind of collide in an intimate relationship, uh, it can be difficult and, and think of what happens when, if I'm sitting there thinking my wife is just being mean and she doesn't care, you know, then, then my behavior is probably going to become more negative and then she's going to perceive that and become more negative back. And then I kind of, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? We start to have these misinterpretations and a mind reading and that, um, you know, sends it down. A bad path pretty quickly. Um, although, like you say, hopefully mature couples get better at that. I know my wife and I, we've been married over 20 years and we're better at that than we used to be. Like if somebody's irritable or having a bad day, I think we both usually can give the other one some space and just say, well, you know, they said this, but not how they usually are. So I'm just going to come back to that later if we need to, or, or, uh, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. And that's, and that's what a healthy relationship has when when partners trust each other you know when they kind of know that okay generally he she is a good person and they're not mean i know that so this is something that's a little bit out of the ordinary um and that's you know that's a good sign it's a it's a bad sign in a relationship where they really are being mean and taking shots you know that's a that's a relationship that's going downhill or that has some abusive tendencies uh, which are important to address as well another thing that i think is valuable to ask is how did you sleep last night and are you hungry because <laughs> <laughs> it, it goes to giving the benefit of the doubt like and it's true like physiologically we are a different we have different brain chemistry going on if we got three hours of sleep or if we haven't eaten since breakfast and it's the afternoon so it, it sounds it's kind of silly but i think uh I think it was Bill Clinton that said he would ask, like he's having like these big meetings and that's like a question he would ask to to see where uh, people's headspace is at. (laughs) Yeah. And it's funny because in in like 12 step groups for addiction, they use the acronym HALT, which which stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If any of these, those things are going on, you know, if you have three hours of sleep or if you haven't eaten all day, you're going to be vulnerable to relapse in addiction. And exactly like you said, you're also going to be just irritable in general and more reactive. Um, And there's some funny research about that too, where they, they had uh, married couples come into a lab and they gave them a little doll, which represented their spouse, like a little voodoo doll. And they, they told them, 
to stick pins in it, depending on how irritable they were with their spouse. And what they found was an exact correlation between between how hungry they were, you know, and how many pins they stuck in their spouse. So, <laughs> so don't uh, don't try to have a difficult conversation on an empty stomach. Better to go out and get a steak and, you know, maybe talk about it afterwards or, or it might not even be a problem afterwards when you're feeling better. That is funny. It, yeah, we're going to change this podcast. We're just going to talk about food and we're yeah. going to say, you know, like, all right, guys, you're having problems. Just make sure you're well fed. Big steak yeah. dinner. If it was only that easy. But yeah, we're, we're going to bed. Right? Same thing. Get get your rest. And... Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm saying that uh, jokingly, but but it is true. I mean, it is very true. We are emotional creatures and anything that is affecting that certainly sleep and appetite and or lack thereof on both of those, then we are not going to react perfectly. Even if we are well fed and sleeping well, we are not, you know, infallible. We are going to have the emotions are going to get the better of us. And hopefully more often than not, we're able to, to keep those not, I don't like to say keep them in check because that I feel like like suppressing them, but just realizing them being, I think, self-aware is the big thing here. And um, it's such an important thing. Do you have any, besides like meditation, are there any exercises that, that people can do to, to try to improve that so that they're not having uh, bad reactions? Well, uh, yeah, I ask people when they're coming to see me professionally, I will ask them questions about lifestyle issues. And I, I'm not doing it to be intrusive or difficult. And almost everybody understands why I'm doing that. You know, I'll ask things like, how are you doing with your sleep? How are you doing with what you eat and drink these days? You know, uh, because I, I talk about this in my book, but I met with a guy once who was coming to see me and he said he was depressed. And as I got to know him and he said his marriage was failing and, and all these difficult problems. But what I found out was he was, um, he was in his 40s. He was staying up late every night playing uh, online, you know, multi, you know, these massive multiplayer games. And and um, he was eating mostly ramen and other processed food. And the kicker was that he was drinking 16 cans of Mountain Dew a day. Wow. <laughs> so so I said, let's start with something other than depression medication. You know, I'm, I'm not even a. I'm not here to prescribe medication anyway, but I said, I think we can make some progress on just some basic lifestyle things. So he and his wife started, you know, eating better. And I, I get that it's hard for everybody. I'm not here to be a, you know, a, a dietitian or anything, but just kind of common sense, um, getting to bed, eating real food as opposed to ramen and cake, you know, and, and Mountain Dew. Um, he started doing better. You know, they just, they started feeling better in general and, uh, he wasn't depressed and, you know, they got along better. So, so those, oh, and, and exercise, that was another big thing. And I almost always ask people about this too, but again, because there's such an obvious correlation with exercise and mental health, it's, it outperforms medication every time. And I'm not trying to say medication doesn't have its role, but I would say for sure, start with taking some walks, you know, even, even if you're not a big gym goer or whatever, do some basic things, you know, get outside for 15 minutes and walk around the block um, most days or that, fire up a yoga video on YouTube or, you know, things that just help your body calm down. Because like I say, people that are that are escalated and irritable, their marriages are going to struggle. Typically, it's just if people aren't feeling good, it's going to come out in that relationship. So, yeah, just take care of yourself in all those different ways we know how to do it and you will have a happier relationship as well. Yeah. Chase and I are both big proponents of eating healthy and being active because we both feel so much better when we are active versus when we're eating crap or traveling or not focusing on taking care of ourselves. Yeah. I, I love how you said that, Jason, because we obviously we started and and we've gone through some great things, but you are taking a very holistic approach when when you're asking your 
clients when, when they come in asking them that because it is so true. Just like in when you go into the doctor, unfortunately, it it's not what always happens that we're trying to uh, treat the symptoms rather than the cause. And we want to deconstruct uh, your communication style and all these things. And certainly everyone can always improve them. But something as simple as like, are you getting enough sleep? What's your diet like? That's really the foundation. And and it is a big part of our lives. And, and uh, we'll have to focus on that a little bit more um, in future episodes. But, but uh, it's so true. Like if you don't have that together, then you can be the best communicator in the world. But if, if you're tired and you're all jacked up on Mountain Dew, <laughs> like you're not going to be uh, the best person to be around all the time. Right. And you won't feel like implementing any sort of communication skills. I mean, we can talk about iMessages. We can talk about being a good listener and paraphrasing. But if both people are stressed out and tired and irritable, they're not able to almost. They're not, you know, they probably aren't going to be willing to, but they, they almost can't be present and calm with each other when they, they're just, they're physically feeling pretty lousy. And, you know, and our culture is not great for relationships. You know, we talk about the importance of relationships. Most people would say that's their highest priority, you know, their marriage and their, their kids and their friends. And, um, but when we look at how people actually spend their time, we see a lot of, you know, responding to emails on their phones, sometimes when they're out on dates with their spouse or they're staying up late to do, you know, binge watch Netflix or, Sort of Facebook. I mean, we we have all these things that are coming at us that are not real uh, relationship friendly, and so you really have to prioritize it. And you know, it's why you know it's great that there's podcasts like yours or other resources. But people have to choose to take care of themselves, to take care of their, of their relationship, and that uh, takes some deliberateness and some self awareness. You know, all those things, and and otherwise, it's it's just not going to be as healthy. Yeah, it's so true. And even as co-hosts of a relationship podcast, like we get the information here, but we have to consciously, and we don't do it nearly as much as we should, but like go and then put these things into practice, like deliberately. We do it, I think, more passively more than often because we get that information. Certainly it's valuable to us, but cutting out that time to really make a deliberate practice in in doing some exercises and in, in trying to improve our relationship, not just because not necessarily when we have a problem, even like, let's make it better. Let's like, we're doing good. Let's make it even better, you know, and try to instead of patching it, let's just give an upgrade, you know? And, and uh, yeah, so we love getting the information from our guests like you. And I hope that people out there listening uh, and Based on the feedback, we seem to, even if it's a couple, that there there's an impact out there. So all really great stuff. And now we got to move forward to the lasting love round. Let's take a second and talk about Talkspace. Talkspace is an online therapy company that matches you with a certified therapist from their vetted network of therapists, and you're able to get therapy straight from your smartphone or computer. And pretty much all of our guests, and it's universally accepted that therapy is one of, if not the best ways to improve yourself and your relationship, to really talk it out with an expert. And there's no reason not to do it now because you can do it from your couch with your smartphone. Yeah, like Chase said, there is no reason that you should slack or not try therapy for your relationship. Even if you're not struggling, therapy will help you improve your relationship and make it even better. It's a great foundation to make your relationship stronger. So if you want to sign up today, visit talkspace.com forward slash I do use the promo code to get $30 off your first month. That's talkspace.com forward slash I do talkspace therapy for how we live today. Therapy is a great way to improve your mind and your relationship, but we know it's also so important to take care of your body and be healthy. And that's why our sponsor findyourtrainer.com is an excellent resource for us and our listeners. Yeah, we got a theme going here. Any 
we got you covered. Basically, mind and body, they come together. If you're getting therapy from Talkspace, but you're sitting on the couch with your therapist all day, not with your therapist, just watching Netflix, you're not going to have a sharp mind. You're not going to feel good. You're not going to feel healthy. So findertrainer.com matches you with a certified personal trainer in your area, and they will meet you outside at the park. They'll come to your house. They'll meet you at the gym. So just like there's no excuse not to get therapy because you can get it from your smartphone with Talkspace, there's really not an excuse to get active. If you need that extra motivation, maybe some guidance, findertrainer.com will match you with a personal trainer to get you going the right way. So to sign up today, visit findyourtrainer.com forward slash I do. Use the promo code I do and you'll get $50 off your first four sessions. That's findyourtrainer.com forward slash I do. What is one tool or practice our listeners can use on a daily basis to help improve their relationship? That's a great question. I would say... Uh, the tool would just be to connect and spend a few minutes together. You know, you always hear about the basics of communication, but like I said, with such a busy and hectic world we live in, you've got to be deliberate about it. So I would say touch base throughout the day, you know, once or something with a text, but then at night or especially on the weekends, you know, take time to just talk and spend time together. So it, it, it almost comes down to as simple a thing as talking together and going on dates, but do it in a way that you're having fun. And that's not just talking about the relationship, because if you, if you neglect time together, then when you do get together, only problems will probably be discussed. And that's not as fun. You've got to have fun, just, um, kind of neutral things that you're talking about. It, the same kind of things that most people do when they're dating and when they're courting, right? They're having fun together. They're spending time just talking about uh, life and important things, but they're not trying to solve problems all the time. So you've got to keep that going. You've just got to keep um, time where you just feel connected and like you're a, like you're a, a, like your friends. Is there a book or resource you can recommend for listeners who want to improve their relationship? Well, I have a book called Love Me True, Overcoming the Surprising Ways We Deceive in a Relationship. So that, of course, has a lot of the things that I think are important about what will help people be honest and authentic and really make a close connection. But I will say there's lots and lots of good stuff out there. And so I would just say, you know, that's part of being deliberate in your relationship is, you know, getting a book once in a while and putting it on your bed stand or, or putting a podcast on when you're driving the car together, you know? So I think there's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a gym, you know, you can go to a lot of different gyms. The main thing is, and you'll benefit. The main thing is just that you go. So if you have that attitude, if we're working on a relationship, it'll benefit. Excellent. Well, your book, as well as those recommendations will be on our show notes page at idopodcast.com. Great. We've been married for almost three years now. Is there any advice you'd give newlyweds? Newlyweds. Well, I would just say to be patient as the relationship unfolds because it's a little different uh, after the first year or two, especially as you move into parenting, as you guys know, right? It, it changes somewhat. Um, your focus changes, your energy changes. And sometimes that sometimes new newlyweds kind of panic at that. They think I don't have the same fire or passion as I used to have. And that's OK. You know that the passion and the fire will still be there. It'll be a little more mellow. But what will happen is it'll develop into this more trusting, relaxed friendship that um, in a lot of ways is really fun and really satisfying, kind of like we were talking about earlier, to where you kind of learn to let things go and you learn that some things are more important than others. So I would just say, accept the process for what it is and uh, allow your relationship to grow and to change. What advice would you give our single listeners looking for a happy relationship? Well, I would say to kind of the same thing. If you focus on being a good person and being a, a good friend and um, that's the, and kind of getting out and being, you know, with other people and socializing and finding, um, you know, opportunities to do that. That's more important than 
maybe worrying about it, or um, I know sometimes people get um, anxious or concerned about that, you know, if they're, if they're saying I'm not finding the right person, but it's really more just about continuing to develop yourself as a whole person, you know, investing time in hobbies and satisfying things and, you know, connecting in, in places where there's other like-minded people. Yeah, it's so true. Like when you're in a relationship or if you're single, a lot of times you got to look within and then you will create the change that you want. And and that's what's so valuable because a lot of times you can feel helpless. People listening might be like, yeah, this is all great, but I can't change my par- my spouse or my partner. And certainly that can be an issue if they're not willing to change, but you got to start with yourself, right? So uh, you've given us some and our listeners some great information today on how we can start and make that change. So why don't we finish up by having you tell us where we can find you online and then we'll say goodbye. Sounds great. I'm online at uh, drjasonwhiting.com, which uh, is spelled out you know, D-R-J-A-S-O-N-W-H-I-T-I-N-G. So that's my website. That's a good place to start. I'm also, I've got a professional page on Facebook and on Twitter where I try to post things, relationship resources, um, interesting things that will help couples. And I do a regular blog on psychology today. And so any of those places, you'll find me as well as my university uh, website as well. Excellent. Well, all those notes will be on your show notes page. And again, we appreciate you so much for coming on and thanks again. That's my pleasure. It's great to talk to you guys. We hope you guys enjoyed today's episode with Jason. Just a few reminders, if you want to check out the blog post that we mentioned in the beginning of the show, you can head on over to our website at idopodcast.com forward slash big four. And in that article, we talk about the four big relationship don'ts and how to fix them. So four things that you might be doing in your relationship that can lead to relationship failure. And we don't want that. So how to avoid them and how to fix it. And there are a bunch of resources on our website that we've been working on for you guys. A bunch of guides and step-by-steps and blueprints to put into your relationship. So we have a step-by-step guide to help manage conflict. We have a dating guide, dating don'ts, what to do when you're online dating, how to cultivate respect in your relationship. So if any of those sound uh, good to you, then head on over to our website at idopodcast.com and they're all there on the homepage. And lastly, if you guys have not tried our 14 day challenge, you can do so at idopodcast.com forward slash 14. You will get a daily email for 14 days and each day you will get a doable challenge for you to implement into your relationship. And we know it will make your relationship stronger and even better. So we hope you guys enjoyed today's show and we'll see you next time.